Hello everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Improving Extractables and Leachables in Trace Metal Testing of Pharmaceutical Packaging. I'm Megan LaRue, the Managing Editor of Spectroscopy, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are pleased to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Spectroscopy and sponsored by Milestone. Over 20,000 customers worldwide utilize Milestone's products for microwave acid digestion and solvent extraction, synthesis and ashing, as well as acid purification systems and direct mercury analyzers for solid, liquid, and gas samples. The Milestone team brings together a vision for the future of science, a passion for technology, and knowledge of applications with the ultimate goal of helping chemists with research and quality control. Milestone's patented technology provides the operator with unsurpassed safety and performance capability through the highest temperature and pressure controls, enhanced safety features, ease of use, and fast cooling, bringing efficiency in an advanced instrumentation laboratory to a new level. Their consultative partnership approach and the trust of their customers have led Milestone to becoming an industry expert in a wide variety of applications involving some of the most challenging matrices. Milestone's mission is to provide laboratories worldwide with the safest, most technologically advanced, and highest quality instrumentation for sample preparation, enabling users to render their activity easier, faster, and safer. For more information, please visit them on the web at milestonesci.com. Before we begin, we have a few important announcements to make. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small green icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window, or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the event. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. Before I introduce today's speakers, I'd like to ask our audience to participate in a brief polling question. Please click directly on your screen to submit your answer. Here's the question. Are you currently analyzing packing material for trace metals? Are you currently analyzing packing material for trace metals? Yes or no? I'll just repeat that one more time. Are you currently analyzing packaging material for trace metals? Yes or no? Thank you for participating in our first poll. Let's take a quick look at the polling results. Looks like 24% said yes and 76% said no. I would now like to introduce today's speakers. We are pleased to be joined today by Dr. Mark Jordy, Dr. James Woods, and Laura Thompson. Dr. Mark Jordy is the president of Jordy Labs, a position he has held since 2006. During that time, Jordy Labs has experienced 11 years of consecutive growth and has become a leader in the polymer analysis industry. Jordy now provides over 1,000 analyses annually and offers more than 60 analytical techniques serving a wide range of industries, including the pharmaceutical, medical device, and chemical industries. Dr. Jordy completed his BS in chemistry at Oliver Nazarene University and his PhD at the University of Connecticut in the Materials Science Division, where his work focused on surface-initiated polymerizations from nanoparticle surfaces. His primary interests include development of improved strategies for identification and quantification of extractables and leachables, as well as chromatographic and mass spectromic analysis of polymer systems. Dr. James Woods is a senior research scientist at Geordie Labs with more than seven years' experience conducting high-level research related to polymers and chemical kinetics. Dr. Woods completed his BS in chemical engineering at Washington State University and his PhD at Carnegie Mellon University, where his work focused on transition metal oxidation kinetics. His primary interests include improved strategies to reduce uncertainty in analytical method development, as well as chromatographic and mass spectromic analysis of polymer systems. Laura Thompson is the National Sales Manager for Milestone, Inc. She manages a technical sales force that is focused on solutions for analytical laboratories in a wide variety of markets. Milestone products include several offerings in microwave-assisted digestion, microwave-assisted extraction, clean chemistry, as well as direct mercury analysis. 
Laura obtained a master's degree in analytical chemistry from North Carolina State University, specializing in the application of atomic spectroscopy techniques. Prior to joining Milestone, she held positions that included global product management and applications specialist with an analytical instrument company, as well as laboratory management in a contract lab. Thank you all for joining us today. Laura, you have the floor. Thank you, Meg, and hello, everyone. I'm going to start us off today and talk a bit about sample preparation as it relates to trace metal analysis. I will also provide an overview of Milestone products and how they fit into the overall analysis process. Then I'll turn it over to James from Geordi Labs for the exciting part of the talk, as he will talk about their USP application as it pertains to packaging materials. But before I get into the sample preparation part, I would like to just elaborate a bit more on uh, Meg's summary of who Milestone is. We are a global manufacturing company that is headquartered in Italy, and we provide products for digestion, extraction, synthesis. We also have a direct mercury analyzer product line, and we also have clean chemistry products. We've sold over 20,000 units globally, and I'm actually representing our North America arm that's located in Shelton, Connecticut, where we offer a full applications laboratory, as well as service and parts to support our local customers. We do consider ourselves to be a high-tech company. We hold over 30 patents, some of which I'm going to talk about today. So as we move into talking about the analysis stream and where sample prep fits in, everyone, regardless of whether you are an, uh, serving an internal lab or an external lab, you have samples coming into your lab and you need to get data out. Samples in the door, data out. It's the part in the middle that tends to be the most trouble for laboratories. We need some type of analysis. For trace metals, that's typically done with either AA, ICP OES, or ICP MS. But before you can get to the analysis part of the, of the process, you actually have to prepare your samples. And therein lies some of the problem. The reason we're talking to you today is because sample prep is very important. Any analytical measurement is only as good as the sample prep that you do prior to analysis. Everything you do to the sample from the time it enters your door to the time it gets to the instrument will contribute to any error or analysis issues. So you want to take care of that sample all through the chain. Also, as more labs are moving to more sensitive instrumentation, such as ICPMS, that provides lower detection limits, it puts even more emphasis on sample prep. We need to make sure that we're not contaminating any of the sample along the way, and we also need to take care of our blanks and our acid, um, uh, our acid cleanliness and the area around our sample preparation. It becomes a very important component of the overall analytical process. So if we go back to our scheme here and take a look at the red box, the sample prep box, there's a lot of factors that go into this section. On the left, you see we are concerned about acid purity and eliminating any contamination, whether the contamination be in our vessels or in the air around our samples or in our lab in general. And then on the right side are a lot of different methods that laboratories use to decompose their samples. So the samples come in, they need to figure out how to decompose their samples. It could be as simple as dilute and shoot, if a sample is aqueous and can just be diluted in acid or water and directly analyzed. That's perfect. For most samples, there's going to have to be some kind of decomposition step. That could happen on a hot plate or hot block. You could use ashing methods or microwave digestion, which is what we're going to speak about today. And there's also PAR bomb applications. Each one of these has its advantages and limitations. Most of us know all about hot plates and hot blocks. Many of us have used them in our labs. You may have them in your lab today. You may use them for some samples and not for others. They do have some advantages, very inexpensive. The capital investment's very small. It's easy to get started up in your laboratory very simple to operate, disposable tubes, 
high capacity. That's a real that's a real winner for most customers. If you're really only limited by the amount of space you have, you can just put as many hot plates or hot blocks in your lab that you can fit. There are some downsides, namely that you are limited in temperature and pressure. This can cause you to have very long digestion times, even for some of the more simple sample types. Also, along the way, as you're digesting over this long period of time, you need to babysit these samples and take great care with these samples. Continuously add acids and waters to keep them from going dry. This causes you to have a high acid consumption, and you can also experience loss of volatile elements. This is the main driver for most customers going to some type of closed vessel digestion. But why microwave? Why is microwave, why has microwave become such an integral part in laboratories? It is an excellent solution for environmental labs as well as other laboratories due to its fast and efficient digestion of samples, its high safety, maximum throughput and productivity, And it really has become an established technology in many laboratories for sample preparation. Once you know you want to move to microwave, what kind of technologies are available to you? So I do want to kind of do a contrast to compare to several different types of microwave digestion um, capabilities. You'll see here a comparison between sequential systems multi-mode or what we consider to be our traditional microwave processing systems, and then we have the SRC technology to the right. For varying reasons, namely the temperatures that they can get to, as well as the pressures that they can accommodate, and the number of samples per run, all lead to a productivity measure that you see at the bottom. As you can see, the sequential systems, one sample at a time, minimum temperature and pressure capability, and it actually provides you with the lowest productivity. For some customers, this is totally fine. You're not asking it to do a lot. You don't need a high temperature. Pressures aren't going to build that much, but you might have a time constraint. The middle category, the multi-mode, is the one that most most people are most familiar with, the rotor-based systems. These are segmented rotors or vessels, multiple vessels, Here you see we have 15 vessels per run. This is for our high pressure system. So those more difficult type samples, this would be the maximum vessels per run. We do have a higher productivity rotor. I'll talk about a little later on. Compared to the maximum productivity and maximum capability, you see on the right is our single reaction chamber technology. This is proprietary to Milestone and I'll talk about it in in more detail um, as the presentation goes along. But one thing to note here is we do have maximum temperature up to 300 degrees C, maximum pressure capability to handle any sample you want to put in it, up to 200 bar. And then we have 15 vials per run. This is our medium medium productivity um, level here. And you can get all of these vials completely uh, completely processed and cooled down in a very minimal amount of time, providing the highest productivity. So once you know the different technologies you have available to you, which one do you pick? What you want to understand is you need to understand your sample. So what are some of the key considerations? Namely, what's my sample? What kind of sample am I going to be asked to digest prior to analysis? Once I get to the ICP or ICPMS, What are the elements of interest? Those two things together will help me decide what my acid chemistry needs to be. I'm going to need particular acids to break down a particular sample type, and I'm also going to need a certain set of acids to make sure the elements of interest are in solution and available to the analysis technique. Once I know those three things, that helps me figure out what temperatures and the corresponding pressure capabilities will be required for that digestion. So why does temperature matter? This is a chart here that just kind of breaks it down for you. I've got three different sample types here that talking about how much residual carbon is left after this sample has gone through a process, a decomposition process, and was able to get to the temperatures you see on the chart. 
We have three different sample types. We have a ginkgo sample in the maroon, kind of orangish color at the bottom. And then the middle trace is the polyethylene sample. And then we have a fish oil sample that's in yellow. As you can see from the chart, for the ginkgo sample, pretty simple, pretty easy to do, basic acid decomposition, getting up to around 180 to 200 degrees C. I'm going to get good decomposition, good breakdown, clear colorless solution with residual carbons of less than half to 1%. No problem. As I work my way up, polyethylene, a little more difficult to do. I'm going to need temperatures up above 200, 200, 220, to really break down that carbon and get it to a level that I want to run on my ICP. Now, if I'm talking about fish oil or something more organic, more reactive than that, I'm going to need temperatures up in the 250 to even 260 range consistently to be able to break down that carbon and provide a sample to the ICP or ICPMS that has residual carbon levels that, I, that are most uh, amenable to running without any problem. So let's look at the three different technologies again and how they stack up against each other with regards to temperature. This just comes directly from the chart I showed earlier. As you can see, the sequential systems get us up to about 200. For the ginkgo sample, that's fine, totally fine. Even for somewhere in between ginkgo and polyethylene, that little range of organic content, I'm going to be okay there. Now I'm just limited by productivity for that one. The multi-mode system, you can see that I can get up and work it and operate around the 240 consistently. That can just about get everything on that chart. Again, for productivity concerns, I might want to move on up the chain, or if I need the higher temperatures, I want to move on up to SRC, because that gets me the maximum temperature capability of 300 degrees continuously. The other characteristic of the three technologies was pressure. Remember from the chart. Sample amount, as well as organic content, play a big role in the amount of pressure that's going to build inside my reaction vessel. As you can see here, this is the same sample processed with different sample weights. And you can see the pressure that's building on the scale on the left from 0.05 grams up to 0.8 grams. So you can see what I'm going to need to be able to contain within my reaction vessel and where I might have some limitations because of the technologies. But one thing I want to point out here, it's not just the steady state, not just the steady state that I'm getting to at the different sample weights, but you can see when I get up to about 0.35 grams, close to 0.4 grams, I get this spike at the beginning of my reaction, that pressure release, if you will, of that, of that, um, that carbon content or the breaking of those bonds. So I'm getting that pressure release, that needs to be contained as well. So if you want to up your sample amount to drive detection limits lower, you're going to need a technology that can accommodate those pressure releases. So again, as we look at these three technologies, we can see there's a, a difference in the pressure capabilities that might tell us which one of these we need for our laboratory, all the way from the sequential system up to the multi-mode um, rotor-based systems, and then on up to the SRC, which gives us the maximum at 200 bar. So now I just want to take a few minutes and just um, chat briefly about Milestone's line of products. Again, we have systems that meet the needs for the rotor-based. That's our Ethos Up platform. And then we also have the, the ultra wave system, which is our single reaction chamber system. I'm going to just spend a couple of slides introducing you to each of these, and then I'll just do a quick contrast of the two. So with the Ethos Up, we actually provide a large microwave cavity with full stainless steel construction and PTFE coating. Within that cavity, we can place several different rotor options, depending on your needs. Like I said before, we have the SK-15. We also have a larger rotor I'll show you in a few minutes. We also have other rotors. And again, lots of different configurations. We are a solutions provider, so we want to talk to you about your sample types and pick the rotor that's perfect for your application, your temperature, as well as your pressure needs. Because you spend a lot of time with the user interface, 
I think it's very important to point out that we have very user-friendly software, over 300 pre-installed methods. It is 21 CFR compliant. And we have this new uh, application where you can remotely connect into your, your ethos or your UltraWave, either one, from an iPad or a computer and actually see what's going on, monitor your, your progress of your system. We do have the different types of rotors. Here's a picture of the two, just to kind of put them side by side. We have the SK-15, which is our high-pressure rotor. For those doing more difficult samples and need about 240 to 60 degrees C routinely, uh, this is going to be your, your, best, your best bet. This one has a, a thermocouple to do direct temperature monitoring so that you get um, good power response to temperature, um, temperature changes. You also have available to you the Maxi 44. This is our high productivity rotor, offers, your, offers you medium pressure and temperature capability um, with 44 vessels. I do want to, to note that all 44 vessels uh, have access to temperature monitoring. That is done with an IR temperature sensor, but every single vessel in the 44 position gets the temperature monitoring. So just to con contrast a bit, I wanted to talk briefly about our SRC technology. This is the single reaction chamber technology developed by Milestone, introduced with our UltraClave in 2006, and then we introduced the UltraWave in 2011 that used the same technology, but in a benchtop model. We have over, well over 600 SRC systems in use today in labs such as consumer product testing, petrochemical, as well as the pharma and Nutra industry. Anyone really needing maximum temperature and pressure capability and or productivity demands would benefit from the UltraWave. I'm not going to, this looks like a very busy slide and I'm not going to go through it in grave detail, but I just wanted to, in order to compare and contrast, I needed to show this. We actually have vials within the SRC that are actually lowered into a Teflon-lined reaction chamber or a digestion chamber. And they are actually lowered into a base load. And what happens there is the base loads what absorbs the microwaves, passes that energy onto the vials that are sitting in the base load, allowing them all to react independently of each other and maximize their temperature and pressure needs. This opposed to the rotor-based systems, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, those all have to be done in a batch because they are all dependent on each other. You have the same pressure and temperature, um, excuse me, the same power being applied to all of those uh, independently, and they are reacting at different rates. Within the ultrawave, we have a variety of racks and vial types. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. We do have um, disposable glass vials that many of our customers use, use, quartz and Teflon, depending on your acid needs, and they come in a variety of sizes and volumes. The compare and contrast here between the UP and the SRC, I think, is the, is the most pointed part of the presentation. This is an example of how you would take a variety of sample types particularly in the pharma industry, and apply them to a rotor-based system. Because of their different reactivities, I would need to batch these. I might be able to mix some of the APIs and raw materials depending on their reactivity, but I'm probably going to need to keep my packaging materials separate and capsules or fish oils or something separate. And all of them would need to be done separately before I feed them to the ICP OES or ICP MS. Now, taking those same exact sample types and putting them at ultrawave, I can actually put all of them together in one rack in separate vials, as indicated by the color-coded chart here. They can all be processed at the exact same time, with the same conditions being applied to the base load, allowing each vial to act independently. And then once they're digested, it is simply, uh, simply take the cap off, pour up, dilute, and I'm ready to run on the ICP or ICPMS. There's no taking apart of the vessel surrounds or uncapping. Um, it's as simple as taking the, the top off. 
that's how I get to the productivity comparison that you see here. We have this is a kind of reflection back on the first chart I showed. Again, sequential versus the multi-mode versus the SRC. As you can see, the same number of samples being done at different runtime and providing us with low, medium, and high productivity capabilities, as well as the more intense digestion capability offered by the SRC technology. So to summarize about the ultrawave, just wanted to just reiterate, very easy handling, no need to um, open and close the vials with tools or, or assembly, very high performance, allows you to digest difficult samples as well as high throughput with the fast cooling and less handling. Also, by using the disposable glass vials, you actually can reduce your running costs. And because we are using a base load to absorb the microwave energy, I can actually reduce my acids that are needed for the decomposition, and I can re, um, save money in that regard as well. The last thing I want to touch on before I turn it over to um, James is our clean chemistry line. We do offer the, um, several products, and this just goes right back to my initial comments about keeping your lab contaminant-free and preventing any type of errors in your sample prep section of your process. We have um, acid purification systems as well as trace clean systems, which allow you to acid steam clean your, your parts, not just vials but also any of your components you use in the laboratory that could benefit from acid cleaning can be done in the trace clean. So with that, I'd like to pass it off to my colleague James from Geordie Labs for the next portion of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. This is Dr. James Woods from Geordie Labs. Good morning and good evening. So today we're going to be talking uh, again about an example where we cover trace metal testing and. Uh, for extractables and leachables analysis relevant to packaging material for pharmaceuticals. Um, by way of introduction, uh, Jordi Labs was founded in 1980 as a GPC analysis lab, uh, and since then we've really blossomed into a full-service polymer analysis lab. Um, and as part of that, uh, we engage in uh, regulatory analysis and studies, as well as uh, investigative and legal analysis. And that could be something like polymer analysis uh, for additives and identification, could be deformulation, discoloration, uh, or it could be uh, a full-service extractables and leachables analysis. Uh, we do more than a thousand projects annually, and uh, of our employees, uh, more than 80% are degreed chemists. So uh, the agenda topics that we're going to cover today are uh, the digestion elemental analysis for uh, a packaging material, uh, and that's going to be using USP guidance uh, for uh, those sort of regulations. Uh, and we accomplished that with an Agilent 7900 ICPMS, as well as the Milestone Ultrawave. Um, we're going to cover some of the regulatory background uh, for these analyses and uh, what are the requirements that the regulations require for this. Uh, and then we're also going to cover some method development for a complex extractables and leachable solution. So the, the sample that we're analyzing in this particular case is an oral pain-relieving gel that you might use uh, to relieve a toothache or uh, some sort of uh, cold sore. Uh, the, the, this is a, available in a generic and a branded version, uh, and the reason that we decided to analyze this is because it has a complicated matrix. There's uh, both a high and a low organic API that's benzoacane and benzalkonium chloride, but it also contains an inorganic API, which is 0.1% uh, uh, zinc chloride. Um, and so it's, it's very important that when, if we're doing a trace metal analysis that we're also able to analyze uh, and quantify the zinc chloride at the same time. And so uh, the regulatory requirements for USP 661.1 uh, uh, say that the material that you're going to use for a packaging material has to be well characterized before you even get to the point of making a packaging system. And that includes things like identification using IR spectroscopy or DSC, some physiochemical testing including acidity, alkalinity, total organic carbon, uh, identifying what polymer additives are present, and then the topic of this talk today, uh, the metals content of that material. And so the metals analysis for 661.1 um, require that you do an extract on the virgin uh, material that you're going to use before it's molded. Um, and so the extraction conditions for this are material dependent. And for this particular analysis, we're going to analyze for aluminum, chromium, titanium, vanadium, zinc, and zirconium. 
And so uh, in following the analysis strategy for 661.1, we're going to extract using uh, the defined conditions. Uh, we have a defined extraction mass. We have a defined extraction volume. Uh, and it dictates what the extraction conditions are. And so this is just a nice survey about uh, what's present in the material before uh, uh, during the analysis. And so the results that we obtained from that uh, are fairly consistent because if you wanted to use this for pharmaceutical packaging, it, it should be a fairly clean material. Um, it, it's not surprising in the, in the slightest. And so uh, moving on to 661.2, uh, now we have to analyze the complete packaging system. And so um, the, the purpose of this then is to also do physical chemical testing uh, in a similar fashion as before on our well characterized on our packaging material constructed of well characterized materials. Uh, we also have to do an extractables and leachable study um, in contrast to the last uh, analysis that looks for the additives as well as the metal content. And we'll talk about how that is, is accomplished, I think, on the next slide. So uh, previously, we had just done an extract. Now we have to do an extraction uh, using several different conditions, and then we have to do a leachable study that's informed by those extractions um, to adequately understand how the drug product could be affected by the pharmaceutical package. And so to do this extractable study, we're going to analyze the packaging system with acidic water, basic water, and a water ethanol um, mixture uh, to simulate a, uh, an organic extract. So once we have those extracts, we're then going to analyze them uh, for extractable metals using our ICBMS. Uh, we're then going to look at what metals were extracted out we're going to digest our drug product, because that would be our leachable solution in this particular case, and we're going to analyze our jet digested drug product for the metals that we observed in our extractable study for leachable metals. So uh, again, remember the, the sample in this case is an oral pain-relieving gel that contains zinc chloride, and so it's very important that we should also get um, a value that's consistent with the label claim, uh, and uh, we'll see later on how um, the milestone ultrawave helps impact that number and, and gives us really good quality results. And so uh, here are the results uh, from our extraction, uh, a comparison between the, the different extraction conditions. You can see the acidic, the basic, uh, the organic extraction, uh, as well as the detection limits that we're able to get um, using our, our Agilent 7900 and our ultrawave. Um, and uh, they're, they're fairly consistent. There's a, a fair bit of material coming out in the ethanol water. That's to be expected because it's, it's going to pull material out uh, preferentially, but it, it's fairly consistent with what you would expect for uh, a package extraction. Uh, now that we've extracted the finished package and we've analyzed the results, now we're going to digest the drug product. And this is where the ultrawave really shines because uh, it's able to take um, polymeric material as well as oils and greases and, and really break them down in, into their uh, substituents and, and uh, allows us to do elemental analysis very nicely. And so uh, to compare the different methods that we would normally use to analyze these sort of products, uh, we did Teflon bomb digestion, we did a rotor-based microwave digestion, and we also did um, uh, analysis using, sorry, we, we did a digestion using the ultrawave. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see um, how those compare. And so uh, historically we've used a, a, a PAR bomb or a, a Teflon bomb for this sort of digestion. And uh, we, we've really been uh, limited to the amount of sample that we can put into uh, one of these bombs safely, uh, because it, otherwise you would exceed the pressure rating for the material and uh, you could have a, a catastrophic lab event. Uh, additionally, uh, if you're going to use this sort of uh, bomb technique to do a digestion, to get an effective blank, you have to do the analysis uh, for the blank before you analyze your sample. And um, that effectively doubles the time that it takes uh, to get a blank sample pair. Um, and then when you add to that, the Teflon liner for these is a consumable. And you can see the, the, con the consumable on the left versus the, the Teflon liner on the right. Uh, and that does have a very important role on um, the limits of detection and the blank measurement that you're going to get for these analysis. Uh, so all in all, it's, it's not an ideal technique to use a bomb like this. Um, in contrast uh, with uh, the SRC from Ultrawave, uh, you're able to digest 15 samples at once, and it takes about 30 minutes per sample. You can digest large sample amounts. It takes um, upwards of 600 milligrams. And they have uh, several options for the containers that you're going to use to digest this. Uh, and if you want to go ahead and reuse these uh, containers, they have a trace clean system, uh, which helps prevent cross-contamination. Uh, 
another benefit is you can quickly swap in new sets of samples. And once your 30 or 45 minutes is, is up, you can swap in a new set of samples uh, and you're ready to go uh, for your new analysis or for your new digestion. Uh, and they're very good at reducing cross-contamination between volatile um, between volatile elements. Um, it, it's a very safe system in contrast to some of the, the bomb setups that we've used before. Uh, digestion is entirely contained within the system and it's also vented for safety. So if there's any, any sort of um, release of acidic gas, uh, for example, nitric acid, uh, it's, it's safely vented uh, through the building ventilation system. Um, so as a comparison between the two methods, uh, you might weigh out 700 milligrams of sample in each tube for an ultrawave, which uh, you might only be able to get 100 milligrams of sample safely into uh, your bomb liner. Um, you can do 15 samples at once, uh, including blanks, um, and it typically takes about uh, 40 minutes to do a complete digestion and cool down cycle um, versus the two hours to cool down to room temperature for a, a Teflon bomb analysis. Uh, and then also the blank analysis that we touched on previously. So uh, here's an example uh, that compares uh, the rotor-based microwave condition versus the Teflon bomb versus uh, the ultrawave. And you can see uh, the clarity of the solution. Uh, and it, it's pretty clear that the milestone um, does a better job at digesting a sample in this particular case. Uh, and uh, again, here are uh, the extraction, sorry, the, um, uh, the digestion of our oral uh, pain relieving gel. And you can see a comparison between the ultrawave, the conventional, and the Teflon bomb. Uh, the results here are in nanograms per gram and then micrograms per gram for the zinc. Uh, and you can see that uh, the results that we get are fairly consistent with what you would expect for the trace elements. And they're also, um, there's a little bit of variation based on uh, the zinc, but we'll get into that in a second. Uh, and again, all these elements were detected uh, in the spiked samples with recoveries of 80 to 120%. Uh, when we look at the label claim and compare that uh, to the zinc chloride uh, content uh, that should be present, we can see uh, that there is actually a, a pretty drastic difference when using the Teflon bomb. Uh, you're still within that 80 to 120%, uh, but again, uh, with the ultrawave, you end up with a number that, that more, ad more accurately reflects the amount that's present um, in the uh, pharmaceutical product. <clears throat> so uh, again, uh, we wanted to cover some of the benefits of the ultrawave. Uh, it, Im it improves the sensitivity and accuracy of uh, your ICPMS analysis by uh, completely digesting the sample. Uh, and also being able to uh, analyze significantly more than um, conventional digestion techniques. It's also a very safe technique. Uh, it, it has uh, some PID controllers in it that are able to detect uh, when there are over temperature and over pressure events. And so um, it, it's a very safe technique that uh, actively senses whether or not it's um, engaged in any sort of catastrophic failure. And it also, it cools down very quickly. So going from 270 degrees C to 80 degrees C in 12 minutes uh, using the water cooled system. Uh, it, we mentioned the low operating costs as well as uh, it limits cross-contamination and we have a fast turnaround with it. So uh, here are some of the other techniques that we offer at Geordie Labs. It's, it's not just uh, digestion and ICPMS analysis. Uh, we mentioned we're a full-service polymer analysis lab. Uh, it's just a, 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 it, it's one component of a larger picture and uh, uh, we'd be happy to discuss that with you further. Uh, we, we like to do uh, analysis that really answers the question uh, that a client comes to us with. Uh, we, our goal is to solve your problem, not to, to do analysis for analysis sake. Um, and uh, I, I think with that, I'll turn it over to our, uh, back to Laura. Thank you, James. I really appreciate that. We learned a lot from your presentation. Just to summarize, I think based on what you heard from mine, hopefully, and what you heard from James, I think it shows how important sample prep is in your overall elemental analysis scheme, and that Analysis really is only as good as your sample prep and how important that is to know what types of samples you're going to be doing and what you need from your digestion. And then to follow up, we talked about how closed vessel microwave digestion is important in that regard and how Milestone offers some solutions for your sample prep to meet your needs. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it back over to our moderator, Meg, for the next portion. Thank you all for such informative presentations. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. 
Our first question is, in your talk, you analyzed for zinc at percent levels while also doing trace elements. Was this done in one analysis? Is it possible to analyze elements present at percent levels and trace levels at the same time? And if so, how did you do it? Uh, I, th I think that's a great uh, question for me. So I think, um, yes, we did analyze in the same uh, analysis. Um, because we're using uh, an Agilent 7900, we're able to, to get both percent level and trace analysis at the same time. Um, and uh, the, the milestone in this case is, is able to really digest uh, the sample so that all of the elements are available for analysis. Uh, and then at the same time, we're also able to analyze the trace and the percent levels. Okay. How much time do you feel you save using Milestone's ultra-wave system as compared to conventional digestion techniques? Um, well, I mean, if you were able to analyze 15 samples in the same time that you would otherwise be analyzing one sample, you'd have a 15-fold uh, acceleration in, in your ability to digest a sample. But it's also, uh, it's also uh, faster at, at digesting a sample. So uh, I would say that it, it does uh, significantly improve um, the digestion time uh, that we have for a sample. Have you found that you need to do much method development on your digestion conditions using the ultrawave system? So uh, the ultrawave system, it, it very thoroughly digests a sample. Um, and so there, there are some cases where we will have to, for example, add gold uh, to help uh, a, uh, analyze an element that uh, complexes, um, but uh, there's not a significant amount of method development that goes into it as long as you're adequately uh, running a method for the sample that you're analyzing. For example, a polymeric material, you may have to make sure that you're putting enough microwave energy into the system and that you're getting a high enough temperature and pressure to digest the system. Uh, so you can, you can effectively scale um, how thoroughly you digest the sample based on uh, the sample constituents. Okay. How should you use extractables testing to inform your leachables testing for metals analysis? Um, that, that's a good question. So uh, you want to use your extractables analysis uh, to let you know what you expect to be present in the sample. It's, it's basically uh, your, your best effort at identifying what could come out of the sample um, under your um, expected use conditions. And so um, when you're de deciding on your effective use conditions that you're going to test uh, for your leachables analysis, uh, you want to make sure that the conditions that you're using for that leachables study um, adequately capture all of those elements. It could be um, making sure that the, the, the leachables uh, conditions are going to adequately capture all of those elements. What are some of the challenges associated with leachables analysis for metals in pharmaceutical packaging, and how do you solve these challenges? So uh, one, one challenge associated with that um, is, is frequently that you'll find uh, trace, um, the, the polymerization catalysts are, will be present still in the packaging material. And so being able to identify those at trace uh, components uh, while also being able to identify percent levels uh, is a, a very important um, uh, analytical capability that uh, we're able to, I guess, address in this particular case, uh, not only by using the ultra wave, but also by using uh, the particular ICMF technology that we have. Um, okay, unfortunately, oh, wait, we have one more question that just came in. What are the chances of metal contamination using glassware? Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, the metal contamination using glassware, um, we effectively use um, glassware that has um, trace cleaning applied to it. So it's, it's able to, uh, it has very low background levels of metals present in the sample. Uh, that being said, we could always switch to a quartz or to a, another cleaned element. Uh, when we do an analysis, um, it's really you have to select uh, what equipment you're going to use prior to uh, doing an analysis, and you're going to base that on what you expect to find as far as uh, trace versus percent level. 
Okay, unfortunately we're out of time. I want to thank the audience for attending and participating in today's event. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Milestone, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's program will be available for on-demand viewing through October of 2018. You will receive an email from Spectroscopy alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to any colleagues who may have missed today's live event. We hope to see you next time. Goodbye.